So now to get started, um, today we're going to be talking about leveraging artificial intelligence to transform the cement production process. It's going to take about 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to hop into a live Q&A period. And so my name is Christina Kendrick. I'm a market development manager here at Petuum, uh, and I'm joined by my uh, colleague, Dr. Roberto Linares who is an AI solutions principal here at Petuum. Um, the agenda for today, we're gonna start off talking about some of the top challenges and considerations that you might face whenever adopting AI. Then we're going to turn over into uh, Petuum's AI pilot product for cement uh, and a specific use case by one of our customers, Semex, talking about that case study and some of the results. We're also gonna be talking about other AI applications for cement and concrete, how to get started. And then um, at the end, probably about 40, 45 minutes, we're gonna turn it over to a Q&A. Perfect. So um, before those agenda items, uh, I wanted to briefly introduce everyone to who is Petuum. Uh, so we are a startup company founded a few years ago. Uh, our CEO uh, was actually and still is the, the head AI and machine learning chair at Carnegie Mellon University based out of Pittsburgh. And while he was on his sabbatical a few years back, uh, and he went and, and took a short um, period of time at Facebook, where he was trying to solve some real world problems uh, with some of the AI and machine learning that he was working on. And something became very obvious to him in, in the real world outside of academia. Um, he was trying to solve these problems and he realized that um, bringing AI to the real world was complicated. Uh, there was definitely a gap on how do you bring this into a scalable environment uh, where things aren't always as clean, as crisp as you might see um, in university or on the academia and research and development side. And so after that experience, he actually went about starting Petulum. Um, since then, he's, he's still one of the top AI researchers in his field. And research is actually still a very top priority at Petulum overall. And so we normally go to a number of conferences. We have been cited by about 50,000, uh, excuse me, 50,000 citations. Uh, for our research, which is similar to that of, say, Google or Facebook. Uh, we also have about 50 AI experts from top schools on our team, uh, in addition to being backed by tier one investors. And then also most recently, um, you can see the, um, the award right under that symphony hand there. Um, late last year, we were awarded the Cement Project of the Year for the work that we did with Semex. Uh, which Roberto will be talking a bit in a, in, a, in a little bit here today during the webinar. So moving on to those top challenges and considerations for bringing AI to the cement industry. So as we all know, the cement industry is highly cyclical uh, and there is a direct correlation with performance and production to the economy. So generally, the better the economy is doing, you're going to expect things like uh, population increase, jobs, construction and development, and in turn, there will be demand for cement. And so as recent studies and statistics show, uh, we are still pulling from that $20 billion federal construction budget from 2018 to reinforce uh, the US's infrastructure which has been good for business. Um, also, PCA, or the Portland Cement Association, has forecasted modest growth rolling into 2020. Uh, recently, their senior VP and chief economist said that the economy is now the longest economic expansion post-World War II. So while PCA does not believe that a recession is near, it does point to a gradually weakening economy. So basically what this means is that um, even though the production rates will start to decline with the demand if the economy is not booming, 
uh, we're also going to see that the revenues that our businesses will take will also decline or flatline. And so companies are going to have to start to look inward to see how that they can keep their profits up with these market dynamics. Uh, with that, it actually also opens a door for an opportunity. Um, if you're able to increase profits during this time, it might be a competitive advantage to adopt some industry 4.0 initiatives. And so there's two main ways uh, that you can keep those profits high during this time. One of those would be cost leadership or how do you produce cement at a lower operating price point and save on the production side? Or alternatively, um, you can do it through premium selling or how do you sell your product at a higher price point uh, because of the brand that you bring as well as the expected high quality of the product that is affiliated with that. And so both of these business models, cost leadership and premium selling uh, are driven by a focus on operational excellence, uh, which can be um, which can be managed through things like technology, such as AI or artificial intelligence. Some examples of that are on the right-hand side. And so specifically with AI, um, we're able to address things like the thermal and electricity consumption. So in cement production, ener energy um, is probably one of the highest cost points to the business. And so if you're able to do things like increasing alternate fuel utilization um, or optimizing energy recovery during the pyro process, uh, you're going to be reducing the need to burn fuel and in turn have dollars and cents savings. And on that note, to follow up, if you are not having to burn as much, um, you're also going to have a reduction in your overall emissions. Uh, and in a time where there's going to be increasing regulations and scrutiny from the EPA to reduce our overall carbon footprint, AI can help you uh, become ENERGY STAR certified uh, or even help enhance your general social economic standing with your customers and neighboring communities, leading into that brand awareness and on, more on like the premium selling component. The last, uh, the last example that I'll give is on the logistics cost. So once you have uh, your cement product ready, the actual transportation of that, depending on where your production facility is, or if you have a network of facilities, the transportation to your distribution centers or to the final goal um, can be very costly, depending on if you're doing it through rail um, or by sea. There's a number of different factors and variables that you're going to have to consider. So moving on, those are just a couple of examples of how you can optimize and streamline your business. AI is definitely a technology that can help there. Um, and it has a huge amount of potential. A lot of the analyst reports are projecting uh, billions, if not trillions of dollars of savings that's potential across uh, multiple industries. But at the end of the day, AI is also very, very hard to implement. And so um, some, some of the considerations that you're going to have whenever you're going through this journey um, are, are listed here. So the first one is um, having AI available at scale. And so um, we're projecting um, that you're gonna have six times or so growth in data in the coming years. This is the normal, everyone's collecting more and more data. And the question is becoming, now that you have this data, how are you able to leverage that to have business insights and actually change the way that you do your day to day? But whenever you are applying AI to that, you're gonna have to consider things like, how do you make sure that that data is clean and is going to provide value in the real time streaming environment, like on the production shop floor. Uh, in addition to that, so not only we're looking at the data, but how is that data and whatever the AI insights are generating, how is that gonna be integrated back into your infrastructure and architecture? What's gonna be the best type of platform to be able to handle all of those different factors and considerations? Another consideration is the AI talent or the machine learning engineers who are actually building the solution. 
So those specialists are rare, they are expensive, and they are also in high demand. Um, also, um, I'd have to say that the machine learning engineers don't think that they are all one and the same. And so basically like one of the reasons why we have 50 plus um, AI experts at Petuum is that each one of them has a specialized skill set um, or a function area where they've been trained in AI, such as computer vision, uh, neural networks, time series data. And depending on the complexity of your use case, or if you're looking at bringing AI to multiple areas of your business, uh, you might need a team of several different specialists uh, in order to work on that project. And then the last bullet here for consideration is actually bringing those ideas or use cases to production or being able to operationalize those ideas in the real world. So once you have the right data, the backend infrastructure and platforms and teams in place, you're gonna look at um, the time it actually takes to build and implement that solution out. Um, I know that a lot of companies, um, cement included, are kind of up against the clock whenever it comes to tapping into the minds of their most experienced operators and teams, especially whenever a lot of those folks who have 20, 30, 40 years of experience are looking at retirement. You wanna make sure that you're able to leverage those insights um, before that time period. And then also, um, debatably, even the more important factor here, once projects are operationalized, um, a lot of times they end up failing afterwards. After you see the initial value, how do you go about maintaining that model to make sure that you are um, consistently performing and showing value? And so uh, depending on where you find yourself in this AI journey, you may identify one or several of these points uh, where you might need assistance. And I'm not going to go into the details today of all the different products uh, and accelerators that Petuum offers, but we can definitely help assess your AI readiness whenever you are ready to do so. And so a quick question for the audience here, I'm actually gonna open up a poll. Okay. So I'd like to ask you folks, which one of these is probably gonna be the most challenging or difficult thing for your organization whenever you look at adopting AI? Is it AI at scale, the data preparation and platform side, the lack of talent, or the actual bringing ideas to production? Okay, I'm going to end the poll here, but it looks like we have um, a higher number on the ideas to production side. And then it looks like it's, it's almost a split between AI at scale and the AI talent. Perfect. Okay. Moving on here, um, one more slide before I'm gonna hand it over to Roberto and talk about um, AI for cement in, in, uh, in the specifics. So the first thing I wanna talk about um, is say you're on board, you're ready and excited to launch AI at the company. Uh, whether you are deciding to build this internally or you're going to be buying a solution, there's normally a standard installation process uh, that, is, that is new to a lot, of, a lot of people. So unless you're purchasing a simple AI plugin or a tool to do things like analytics or dashboarding, chances are good that your AI solution is gonna be custom and unique to you. And so a lot of times the, the building of that is done behind the scenes, um, the buyers and the users aren't necessarily privy to what's happening. And people refer to that as the black box. And I know that a lot of folks don't like that. And so I just wanted to spend um, a minute or so on opening up that black box and kind of showing you what goes on behind the scenes whenever we go about building an AI solution or a framework. And so 
the first thing clearly is defining the actual business problem. And that sounds simple enough, um, but I want you to keep in mind, especially whenever you're just getting started, that choosing the right use case is key to your success. And so if you focus somewhere that is like your most complex and ambitious problems up front, it might take multiple milestones or iterations in order to show value. Um, also, just the time to implement alone might be a little while. And so if it takes too long to see a return on your investment, you might start to lose interest um, or support from your executive sponsor or whomever is, whomever is supporting your initiatives. Also, if you do only your low hanging fruit or things that are very simple to execute, it might, um, the results that you see might not bring you um, enough value to justify the, the work that you're doing. And so we definitely recommend um, somewhere in the middle would be the sweet spot. So something where say you have multiple inputs or integrations, um, there is a human component um, where someone is making decisions. Also someplace where there's high variability or it's difficult to predict what's going to happen. Um, being able to use AI in these types of environments and being able to have that data-driven approach is definitely a good place to start and you'll see a difference whenever you're using AI rather than traditional or conventional techniques. So the next piece here is after you've identified the business problem, how do you go about framing the technical solution or basically translating that um, into something that's digestible for the engineers or the machine learning um, folks who are actually building the solution. And so here you're looking at things like what are the inputs, the goals, the constraints, um, also the data itself. We're gonna be looking and evaluating, do you have the right data? Do you have enough of the right data? Um, and so this is just um, right here, a screenshot of one of the tools that we use for um, our AI cement pilot in order to be able to translate your particular business needs um, into that model that we're building. The third point here is how do we go about um, integrating your existing tools and team with what we're creating? And so AI models aren't, aren't as simple as just creating something in a back room without understanding of your processes or the people who are using it. And chances are good that we're not replacing any of these third party systems. And so what we're really trying to do is help build on what you already have and making sure that we have a, a human centered approach to the design. So it works well with your team and it's really easy to adopt. The next two steps go hand in hand. Um, so measuring the success and being able to continue to improve upon the model that you've built. And so after we've built the model, you're going to want some time to assess the results. And so here at Petulum, we go through this validation and reconfiguration cycle until we reach um, the success criteria that we've set for ourselves and with our customers. And so something that's actually pretty, pretty often overlooked is once you've reached that success criteria, how do you go about making sure that you continue to provide value and you're performing um, up to spec? And so one thing that's normal is as you collect more and more data in that streaming environment, your models will start to diverge over time. And so in order to compensate for that, you're going to have to retrain things um, to make sure that you stay within the accuracy threshold. Um, depending on how that model was built um, and intended to be maintained, unfortunately, sometimes uh, the engineers have to start from scratch. But if it's done well, and traditionally what here at Petulum we do is we have a continuous self-learning feature, and also we have certain triggers. So once you reach a certain stage and we the divergence is no longer acceptable, we can go about and trigger a retraining uh, without actually disrupting the current workflow. And so what that really means in a nutshell, that the longer that you have these models running and activated, the better and better your results will continue to be. 
And so now that we've covered the generic approach to creating a, an AI solution uh, and how it can be applied to your business, I wanted to hand it over to Roberto so that he can go into the details about bringing it into the cement industry. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Christina. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we are gonna see how uh, Petrum AI pilot is used for the cement uh, processes. Uh, specifically, uh, we're gonna be talking of a use case of a clinker cooler, which, which you know is, is a very important piece of equipment for the kiln because it recovers energy, it, it cools down the, the product, and uh, it's, uh, it has to be uh, operated in the maximum efficiency as possible. Could we go to the um, next? Yes, okay. So first, um, any of these projects and solutions are, um, all of these are running in the same uh, platform. Uh, this is the Petrum Symphony AI platform, uh, which is an agnostic um, tool that allows us to run models, train models, um, execute them, right, in real time. We can uh, read information uh, from any system. Uh, we can get, uh, let's say, relational data, uh, time series information, historian information on a structured images. So all of that information can be processed by the algorithms. Uh, first, of course, they need to be trained and these, uh, these models and templates of these models can be, uh, uh, can be scaled in a sense that if you have uh, one cooler model in one plant and you, want, you would like to uh, now have a secondary model in, in another, for another plant, you, you, we already have um, a, within the platform a template to follow so it's, it's faster to go and in, uh, do the implementation of the second one. So initially, um, if, uh, you know, if, we, uh, you know, if, we, if we see the, the process in a plant, uh, any uh, operator has his own comfort zone. Um, this comfort zone um, might be different for each one. So it could be that one operator uh, likes to run in certain conditions. When there is a shift change, uh, somebody else feels that it's better to operate in, a, in another area. So what uh, Petrum AI does is that we collect all of that data that is recorded in the process data historian or DCS. Uh, we can get uh, uh, thousands uh, uh, of that uh, data points, or of course, uh, hundreds of thousands of data points uh, to understand the relationship between the different variables. So what is the relationship between the uh, input variables to the outputs? And these outputs are either the values that we want to optimize or the constraints that we want to um, justify. So we always start there in that comfort zone. And as I said, it could be different bubbles uh, of zones. So it could be uh, that person A has certain setting, person B. So as we uh, uh, develop the model, um, we can uh, take all of that information and create a model that will respect all of the constraints and we will be able uh, to optimize the system without violating the constraints and going to um, an, a, a better uh, point of operation. So that is a, a, a kind of our approach, of course, that the objectives can be multiple. Uh, in this uh, diagram where you see auto steer on versus off, uh, you, you, you basically, you see that uh, the objective variables tends to, tends to be maximized uh, or it could have a better uh, sustainability, right? For example, in this case, now we are seeing the AI uh, uh, pilot zone that uh, considers all of the uh, operation, for, forms of operation uh, found in the, in the data. And uh, we are moving uh, from, a, uh, from that green dot of operation to a place where we get uh, more um, more efficiency, and as the as the uh, data collection and streaming and historical data is, is available, we can always retrain the model with more with more information and to have a more robust uh, more a more robust uh, system. Yes. Yeah. So in this case, uh, we are uh, looking at the. Uh, the way that we implement the Petro industrial AI in a real plant. Uh, first, we start with the uh, predict phase. Uh, in the predict phase, 
uh, we are able uh, to, uh, to create a model that will tell us for each of the objectives and each of the constraints in advance what these values will be for the current states. And uh, if you see the screen in the bottom, uh, we are doing a very nice uh, prediction of that, uh, the, that secondary or tertiary air uh, of the uh, clink, clinker, cool, clinker cooler. And then once we, uh, we can do that prediction and we are happy with the, with the prediction, uh, we can now go uh, to the uh, prescription mode. And the prescription is basically finding the set of optimum values uh, for the handles that we can move in the process uh, in order to achieve the multiple objectives of, uh, of course, respecting its their own uh, weight, uh, weight factors. Once uh, the model has been uh, validated that by the subject matter expert of the customer and the operator feels comfortable, uh, they can uh, apply automatically these prescriptions for the process. And this is very valuable because uh, in a system like this, uh, depending on the type of cooler, for example, for this case, uh, we need, an operator has to move seven, eight, uh, or more, uh, more than 10 knobs, depending on the type of, uh, of uh, uh, clinker cooler. So what AI can do is do, the, uh, do those changes automatically, let's say every, every five minutes to get the optimal performance. Mm -hmm. Could we go to the next? So in the case of uh, the cement plant, uh, we have been working uh, on, on different modules. Uh, we have been working in, uh, not only in the cooler, we are working in the uh, pyro, pyro process, uh, also ball mills. Um, when we talk about ball mills, we're talking about the complete circuit, uh, including separators, um, also the, let's say, bucket elevator, and all of the variables in the system. So this is, um, um, you, we can take all of the information of the, uh, the circuit, as well as uh, vertical mills, help with uh, emission reductions uh, as either as primary emissions uh, within the pyro process or secondary emissions uh, with uh, the uh, mitigation um, uh, equipment that you might have at hand. And um, as a, an additional module for the pyro process, we can do the, uh, the fuel optimization to increase alternate, alternate fuel. And here basically you are seeing some of the uh, uh, objectives uh, of the customer to increase uh, alternate fuel. Uh, you will see in the use case how we are increasing the and sustaining uh, higher secondary and tertiary temperatures. And the customer has reported um, in increases in production rates and also uh, of course, decrease uh, the decrease of uh, energy, specific energy uh, consumption, uh, the reduction of uh, primary emissions, and maintaining clinker temperature uh, to within within the constraint. And some of the uh, sometimes um, uh, stability it, it, it might be a direct objective of the AI solution, but even even if it's not. Uh, what we have seen uh, regularly is that the standard deviation of the process goes down uh, when you have, have uh, sudden, the sudden changes that AI can, do, AI can do to optimize your process. Could we go to, to the next? Um, oh, yes, uh, we have a yeah, question. We do have another poll here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go ahead and launch this for everybody. So, now that you see what um, modules that Petroum has AI Pilot available for, I'd like to ask you folks, um, if your organization were to start, which one of these assets do you think you would start at? Would you start cooler only? Would you look at the entire pyro process? Or would it be at one of your ball mills, either a, a raw or finish mill? All right, we've got a couple of um, answers coming in. Okay. It looks like we are just about even, Roberto. So it looks like folks have um, 
interest across the board on on all of their assets here. But yes, and that's very that's very interesting, and it's always good. I mean, to to be open. I mean, to find what is the process that you feel that has a higher value, and also probably for the existing uh, initiatives that you have. Probably you have a gap in one ball mill, or uh, probably there is no expert system in another. Right, so that will probably uh, affect the opinions, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right, so yes, continuing with this uh, uh, example, um, uh, as uh, you know, one of the big differences of AI versus uh, non AI, or I would say traditional types of modeling, is that here the model is created with the data, and that's uh, data is, is real and it doesn't have really any assumptions, right? And also uh, we can uh, get as many variables as possible. We can have more than 40, 50 variables in the, in the system. Um, we can have a group of goals. Um, in this case, typically the goals um, that the customer has requested us to do is to maximize secondary, maximize tertiary, uh, minimize uh, the uh, exhaust gas uh, temperature and minimize the clinker temperature. Uh, and then for that, uh, we, we have certain knobs. We might have seven, 10 more, more fans. And with that, we, uh, you know, those are the things that we can move. We specify the things that we can manipulate. And, and then any other variables that will indicate to the model that something is changing can be added. It can be the chemistry, uh, the feed rate that, some, that is used as an internal variable uh, to the model, but it's also, uh, it can be used for uh, dynamic constraining and dramatic constraints, also the burning zone, and any, any information uh, can be added uh, to create the, this model. Mm -hmm. So now we are gonna go into the, uh, in, a, in a bit, to a video. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will ask uh, to, uh, to pause and when we see the first uh, dashboard um, about the, uh, the solution, right? So here, uh, here if you see, uh, typically uh, we provide in the, in the first delivery when we are talking about uh, uh, predictions. So we, we provide a dashboard and, and the dashboard can be provided uh, with uh, their existing uh, dashboard technology a standard in the company. We can also provide uh, our own, um, uh, the ones that we use. Um, and, and here, what you can see is that you, you are seeing the secondary air temperature, you are seeing the kiln uh, hood pressure, the, uh, the average under grade pressure, and we are seeing in every of those, in, in those graphs, we are seeing both the, the forecast, uh, prediction right versus the the actual the actual value and and any if you see in all of those that uh, we are following very very closely uh, uh, the, the the actual value so uh, if we if go to the next uh, um, we you know we can go with a little bit more detail uh, you know one one of the temperatures if we, if we can stop a little bit so this is really really impressive because uh, I mean, the variation is very high of this temperature. Uh, the slopes uh, coming up and down are, are kind of high. And the, the impressive thing to me is that the orange line, it is ahead. This is ahead of time. And the blue line, it is uh, following it. So we are predicting uh, you know, what is gonna happen in the future. And by, by that virtue, now the system, if it knows that it can predict well, it knows uh, what is the best combination of, of movements of the uh, prescriptions, right? The, that will maximize, let's say, secondary and tertiary and minimize uh, clinker temperature. Could we go a little bit to you know, keep, keep going? And then if we stop a little bit right there, um, you know, we can see uh, the different uh, uh, prescriptions for the different um, fan flows. So we have here the fan flows all, uh, each of them, 
and also we have the great uh, strokes, uh, stroke speeds. Uh, and all of those are, uh, you, know, can, you, you know, you can see the actual value and the actual, the one that we are suggesting. And for example, in this graph is very powerful that the user can see what it has been the range between the last eight hours in the box plot and within the blue, uh, blue box, you can see at 50% of the time you have in that, you have in that area. So even if, when you are just uh, using the system in a supervisory mode is, without control loop, uh, a closed loop, you uh, can see that the prescriptions are within, uh, uh, within the ranges that operators have seen. And then in the right, uh, we're seeing that the objectives are going in a certain direction, that the constraints are not being violated. violated. So that's, that's very powerful. Yeah, so here we can see also the great strokes uh, and then the constraints. Um, and here we stop a little bit. Uh, here we, you know, we have the capability to monitor your system, uh, not only to uh, provide the uh, op uh, forecast or prediction and optimization values, but also to uh, understand what is the performance, the like, uh, key performance indicators so that we can help you to see the difference when you are using, uh, let's say the regular operation, the common operation versus the AI based. And then uh, so that you can uh, estimate uh, uh, what is the value that is re being returned to you in terms of energy, in terms of cost, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and here uh, we're seeing uh, the results uh, uh, of, uh, of our customer, CMEX. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the customer has some challenges. They understood that they, uh, they have a complex, uh, complex system. Uh, we know that uh, cement operations have many variables. Uh, there is a lot of noise in those variables and there is delay, right? So. Uh, you know, we, we wanted to be more proactive, le less than reactive in the operations. And, and we, you know, the customer want to have more sustainability, uh, improve the quality and, and, and also keep the cost within constraint. So uh, they partnered uh, with us uh, and they implemented Petrum AI a pilot, uh, a, a, software, a software as a service. Um, we, we went with them uh, with the different phases from they were the ones that I described from predict, prescribe to uh, until we went to supervise tier. And these are uh, some, of the, some, some of the benefits that they, were, uh, they wanted to share uh, with us. So for example, in the, uh, one of the US uh, plants uh, and in Mexico plant, you see a, a high increase in secondary air temperature and that's in Celsius. Um, that's, uh, the tertiary was uh, had a significant increase in in Mexico, but not as high in um, in the U.S. plant. Uh, and then we, uh, you know, we were able to, uh, you know, to maintain the clinker temperature. Those changes were uh, still acceptable. It is possible to tune the different weight factors uh, in order to to have a different uh, a, a, a different different results. And uh, you know, one of the factors that, or one of the results was that, for example, we see that the speed of the grade that was not an objective, we have uh, less variability, less variability in all of the state uh, variables. And we had, uh, uh, well, they reported that, you know, they had more uh, cons consistent and golden, uh, golden day operations as that was their, their um, basically the vision for, uh, for AI industry for, for zero. Perfect. Thank you, Roberto. Mm -hmm. So that concludes the AI pilot um, section. I'm going to take uh, the next five minutes or here to go through the remaining slides. So this next slide talks about other applications or parts of the business where AI is applicable for cement and concrete. So Roberto chatted about 
how we have used AI for asset and process optimization for the manufacturing of cement. Um, we can also look at other things like the quality prediction, uh, like you mentioned, using alternate fuels um, and um, monitoring and optimizing the emissions. But there are, there are so many other places where AI could be a good fit. So starting all the way at the beginning from your planning processes. So like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, PCA, and I'm sure your organization has a way to uh, forecast what the demand is going to be for that year and then making iterations to that plan depending on, depending on how things are going. And so being able to do touchless demand forecasting um, capacity planning, resource optimization, so that you have the right plan for the different production facilities across your network, as well as on the, um, on the procurement side. So once you have a plan in place, how do you go about procuring the raw materials, um, doing that intelligently? Um, also managing the inventory can be, can be a huge burden for some, some organizations. So that's also an opportunity for AI as well as on the later half, I'd say. So once you have a product, how do you go about delivering that product to your distribution facilities or to the end customer? And also some of the more um, general managing components of your business. Um, so being able on the equipment and manufacturing side to detect anomalies and being able to smart alarm your operators, your maintenance team of, of what's happening, um, doing things like document digitization, rather than keeping um, information in PDFs or contracts stored in information silos, how do you make this accessible to more stakeholders? Or even things like chatbots. So if we go to the next slide here, we're going to dive in on two of these different use cases. So the first one is the delivering cement to the distribution facility or the final leg from the distribution um, center to the customer of the construction site. And the goal here is to integrate all different types of tools and informations and analyze and optimize the order fulfillment in real time. And so you probably have a planning process to do this in advance, but the matter of fact is that things change in the real world. And so how do you, how do you compensate and overcome that? And you can see here that the very first point that I have listed under the potential value is customer satisfaction and retention. Um, actually, the, the customer buying experience has been cited as a primary driver to change the future supply chain. Um, it's actually um, one of the most important factors for business growth and profitability, um, especially whenever price and product driven approaches are not necessarily sustainable for long-term customer retention. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is in the current market where we have excess supply in the system uh, and cheaper alternatives may become available, one way to make sure that your customers um, continue to come back and they don't switch to a different supplier is to make sure that they have an enjoyable experience. And so being able to have, again, a customer-centric approach and supply chain can help you gain market share and acquire new customers or keep your, your best customers happy. And so through AI, if we look at this graphic here on the left-hand side, um, you, can do, you can do several things. The first bit is how do you go about integrating all these different third-party um, um, tools and sources and provide a dashboard for easy reading and end-to-end -end visibility of your operation. So here you might consider things like the TMS or the traffic management system to see where your trucks are at any given moment, um, or your ERP system to see what available uh, product and assets you have available to you, and also the CRM or your order keeping system what are you trying to fulfill that day and making sure that you're utilizing your assets and your resources well. Another, another consideration is being able to recognize and adjust to those changes in real time. So on the top, we have some things that could change um, very dynamically. So say if there is weather that is predicted for that day. 
Um, how are you able to um, anticipate some of the delays that are gonna happen on the road um, and create some traffic and then potentially increase your idling time? Um, now, now you're not utilizing your trucks and your drivers um, to the best of their ability and you're probably incurring more transportation costs in order to actually transport that product to the final site. And then also another thing to consider um, is how are you able to um, factor in all these different variables and help you prioritize what is the most important. And so especially say if customers are going to be modifying um, when their um, expected delivery is um, or any details on that, how are you able to make sure that you are um, evaluating all the different contracts and expected deliveries for that day, maybe even um, recognizing buying, buying patterns from your customers and making sure that you are prioritizing and minimizing um, any types of fees if you were to miss a delivery because of last minute change or because traffic or something of the like. Um, and then lastly, this, this entire process is going to be continued to be monitored or supervised by someone who's looking at a region. And so say if anything slips between the cracks, being able to have a live tracking and alerting system in place um, so that you can alert that, that person of what is happening. And similar to what we're doing for AI Pilot, give them the option to accept um, the recommendation that the AI system has in place or to, to oversee um, or excuse me, to supersede that recommendation if based on their experience, they think that something else is a more appropriate action. Okay, the last, um, the last place where AI could come in hand um, is going to be in the form of chatbots. Uh, and, and while I know this is something that is a little bit unique or different than our traditional day-to-day, -day, um, the fact of the matter is there are um, several places in any business where something like a chat bot could come in handy. So think about regular business functions and tasks um, internally and externally this could be applied to. Things like your human resources department um, or doing your internal daily operations reports uh, or even externally, how do you go about ordering or revising an order um, or maybe someone just has general Q&A on the pricing or availability of product. And so once more, you can see that this loops back to the customer experience, making sure that they have a satisfactory experience with you, um, no, matter, no matter what type of task they're doing, having quick, accurate, and um, a standardized way of making sure that they're getting, they're getting similar results, no matter if they're talking to one person or the next. And so today, if you were going to try to implement a chat bot with some of uh, some basic tools, the complication is that uh, traditionally a chat bot requires very specific question and answer pairs in order to provide value. So for example, say um, going back to that HR human resources example, if someone were to um, um, interface with your chat bot and ask about what are the vacation um, or the, the vacation days that the company offers, someone is going to have to think of all the different ways that someone were to ask that question and provide the proper um, answer pair to go along with that. And you can imagine that as that list of questions lengthen, um, it takes a lot of time to, to build and maintain that QA pairing. And also it's, it's gonna be static, right? You're only pulling from information tools from that Q&A pair. Now, if you think about um, similar to what we just talked about with the order fulfillment side or even on AI pilot, if you're able to pull from multiple sources for information, um, say if, here you're able again to, to look at um, a contract that you have with a customer uh, or you're able to look at the TMS where a certain vehicle is. Now if one of your customers is reaching out to and interfacing with this chat bot and it says what is the status of this this delivery 
now you are able to, um, by using some of these cutting edge NLP techniques, you're able to anticipate the underlying intent, uh, really what, what that person is trying to ask and give them appropriate and understandable responses. And really whenever we're pulling from all these different sources of information, now you have a chat bot um, and an AI application that can really be, be used across the board and enhance a lot of your workflows. And so lastly, to wrap things up here, um, now that we've, we've, we've told you um, the basics, the considerations of what to look for whenever um, you're adopting AI uh, and how it could be applied to the cement business, now we leave like, where, where do you go from here? And so um, here I've got a very short list for you. Um, the first thing you're gonna wanna look at is list out some of those promising use cases. Like we talked about before, um, these are normally some of like your medium complexity use cases. Um, even if it's challenging, I think as long as, as long as you have that clear business definition of what you're trying to solve, that's where you wanna start. You want to identify the data sources, um, the history, the tools you're trying to integrate with, who is your project team. Next, you're gonna to wanna to complete a technical and a business assessment um, saying, is AI the right fit for you? Are you ready? Have you, are you working with the right vendor? This might be somewhere, this might be the step in the journey where you're gonna to wanna to reach out to someone like Petulum um, to help you do this assessment and see where you wanna take things next. Then what you want to do is define success. Uh, this is not going to happen overnight. It's not magic, right? So we need to um, outline what are some of those milestones and what is going to provide you value at the end of the day. And then lastly, it's, it's as simple as just getting started. So um, that is the overview of, uh, of Petron. That actually wraps up all the content that we have today. And then we were going to um, break and turn over here to some of your questions. So I have a first question here. Um, Roberto, this one, this one might be a good one for you. Okay. Um, so what do you do if you don't have enough or the right kind of data? Oh, okay. Well, the, the thing is, is the, when we talk about optimization applications, um, there are some, most plants have data historians, right? And, and sometimes they have DCS. So there is limited history in those, DCS, for example. But the thing is, um, in reality, the, uh, what I will say is this, if the operator can operate with certain uh, type of information, then AI can potentially do. So we need to look at the spe specific case uh, and then we need to see at uh, the range of time. And what we have seen that mostly uh, customers have enough information, right? For, unless that the process just started yesterday. In reality, uh, most industrial processes have information for uh, the, the applications that we have been, have been doing. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it depends, right? It, it, I would say that generically speaking, yes. It's 90% of the cases we, we will have information. In other cases where we don't have information for a specific instrument, sometimes we go by by not adding that instrument, like the way that the operator will operate without knowing that value. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, here is another one. Um, so this question is about other AI applications. And so they are asking, is it possible to implement a maintenance replacement strategy? For example, timely replacements of rollers and or table liners for vertical roller mills. Is it possible? Right, so if there is an existing application, uh, and yes, of, of course, that like in any retrofit, right, you need to keep your older application working, right? And then, uh, then once you do, you do, do, do your, your AI, you do the validation. And then afterwards, when the uh, validation has been completed, then you can, you can switch to this, this application. This becomes your master, your master application for AI predict predictions, and then you decommission the other one. But, but again, uh, this is 
you know, a, a, every time we go to a plant, there is already a process in place. Either if that is a, let's say, a first a principles type of model, or is a, there is an expert system, or that is something. So it's uh, all that's always uh, something to to have in in, pl in the plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. There's only a few more questions here, so we'll get through these. Um, how long does it take to implement AI pilot for clinker coolers? For which one? For the coolers. For coolers, we are talking about uh, probably two to three months uh, since we collect the data. Uh, to commissioning, uh, it, you know, that could be in the first implementation. Probably we can speed up a little bit. Uh, of course, I am saying here uh, that we have the data that we can connect, uh, but that's typically the case uh, for the cooler. Mm -hmm. Okay, and last question, question here. Um, what are the in-house technology requirements for AI? Okay, uh, okay. Well, the good thing about uh, the SaaS um, offering is that we basically we just need to connect um, because typically uh, plants already have uh, a control system they have an OPC typically for communication so if that is the case we can do if there is a historian uh, you know that facilitate things but in reality uh, the the offering that we have allows us to have a very minimum installation in the customer size more the agent uh, for data collection and to do write backs. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's minimal from the point of view of, um, let's say, additional, uh, let's say, uh, say hardware or software, right? Of course that, you know, that's from, from the point of view of the materials, right? When we talk about people, of course, we need to have a subject matter expert, the customer side, uh, to provide uh, information about their specifics uh, of the, the of the asset. Great. All right, Roberto. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining today um, and learning how you can leverage AI for your for your business.